It has not passed my notice, and certainly not yours either. How many a man in saintly robe, in his heart of hearts, only have room for malice. In that lie his soul joy, and from that he takes comfort when dark clouds assail him. He has armed himself so that his loins are girt about with spite, and he wears the breastplate of wickedness, and his feet are shoed with the preparation of a gospel of animosity. Above all, he takes the shield of malice, and also the helmet of hatred, and the sword of meanness. Thus armed he can withstand the demise of his fellow man. For how else can we explain the search of damnation and hell videos on YouTube? How else can the tribulation be a best-selling book series among believers? And the smiting of sinners, a lousy but still successful video game in the younger strata of a church-going populace. This reminds me of a poem from the Swedish poet Nils Felin, who when having listened to the maestro of Swedish Pentecostalism, Levi Petrus, wrote this poem. Let the children of this world laugh at us, for who will be the last to laugh? So I heard Levi Petrus intonate some ten years back. Yes, in God's good time it will be our turn, he repeated, like he sucked on a lollipop. Then I came to think of Lazarus, that our Lord should have such a lousy board and lodging, not for the rags and flea, but for the malice. This poem of Feline tells the tale of Christendom as a social factor with brute force. Christians have always been preoccupied with the hereafter, though often more on the behalf of others. Verily, Jesus on some occasion cursed his followers for being so possessed with the demise of others, telling them that they should mind their own business first. But he himself, Big G, often fell in the practice of ranting about killing and mutilating solely for the sake of sweet revenge. Since the impotence of a Christian religion to reform society, as well as the individual, to the better, is open for everyone to see. Its only remaining forceful argument is demonstrated in damnation eternal. I think this is why the young are impregnated with hell bell ringing. And modern technology and psychological know-how are employed to the fullest to burn the image of a dreadful cost of dropout into the minds of innocent children. If all Christian literature were placed on a scale, the balance between works on heaven would be far outweighed by those on hell. Hell is what makes heaven spin around. Hell is what makes heaven so used to sweet from a psychological perspective. To know that those who do not share my belief are tormented while I am having fun is the theme of many psalms, and to partake in the torturing is considered bliss. Blessed will be the one who ceases and dashes, if you remember. Christendom has never been about compassion. It is in fertile soil for such emotions. In its grand scheme of salvation, only big words and big deeds count for anything. The mutilated morals and institutionalized hypocrisy of those adhering to its dogma is thus no surprise. Yahweh demanded that the youth mutilated their bodies before his altars, but the old enemy of man could not stop there. To reign supreme, he needed a mortal blow to be dealt right in the soul of man. What kind of blow this was? It was not so much a blow as it was a wall, a wall erected to close in and to close out. It was the wall of tribalism, only in the murk waters of strict adherence to the clan and equal animosity to those of other clans could his Reich stand for a thousand years and beyond. The legacy of Christ and his apostles had flooded the earth with innocent blood. It was the refusal to see a man in the other that led way to the sword mission. 
Christendom was literally spread at the edge of a spear, as an old Scandinavian chronicle laconically describes the mission to Christian Finland. Here could everyone buy his life by being baptized. Her kunne var en sit liv köpo som lät och sig döpo, as it sounds in old Swedish. The buying of one's life was not metaphorical. Those who refused were beheaded. The same method of evangelizing was held on to for well over a thousand years. Today, when most states are secularized enough to withstand the Christian mob's cry for blood, the mentality of old finds new and more subtle ways. The hell scare is still cherished as the greatest sacrament, and it is forced and thrown at all that comes within reach. The bombastic vocabulary is also eagerly employed when people of other nations are accused of being possessed by evil spirits. And preachers like Benny Hinn lament that the demons coming with the immigrants lack green cards. The distribution of food and shelter to those in need can also be sadistically withheld and cunningly exploited to advance the Christian Reich. This was the method employed by the early church before it took control of a state and could use brute force to make its way across the globe. I don't purport that all who believes in Yahweh march in God's army as for war, but a great many of those who take that dreadful name unto themselves are. Still there are many lukewarm Christians whose beliefs are nothing more than some fuzzy idea about reunion with loved ones after the death, and that life has some meaning above and beyond. There are also the lofty-minded theologians who can write whole books about ellipses of love, and whose main concern seems to be to find some room, however small, that can justify the continued existence of a discipline in an age of reason. But in the same manner as the collaborators are necessary support troops for every dictator's army, so are the lukewarm and the lofty-minded Christians the soil in which the grapes of wrath are sown. Without the billions of dollars they give as tribute to the inner market, and the friendly home ground they provide for the fanatic fools, the Christian Reich would collapse, and with it the walls that lock in and lock out. Then at last can arrive a time when man is set truly free.